to. But we have organized our society in such a way that we have deadened our nerves to be able to be sensitive to that pain. We cannot hear it when the poor cry out. It does not affect us, and so therefore, for most of us, it does not exist. And so we let problems fester and we let them grow until they become overwhelming and until they become damaging to many more. And I think if we are going to actually end extreme poverty in the world, we have to learn to see people in poverty as the most important points of information we have in society. They are the ones who feel the pain first. They are the ones whose signals we need to listen to. We need to hear what they are saying because they noticed how society is going wrong. They're the ones that feel first the problems that we need to start working to, together to address. But not only do they feel it first, they also have some idea then of what can be done to fix it. And that is why developing leadership within communities of poor people is so important. So their voices can be heard, they feel confident to speak up to say, this is wrong, I feel pain, and this should not be happening. And here's what I think can be done to stop this pain from occurring. We need to develop good leadership. We need to facilitate that leadership. Let them take the lead. Let them show how the pain is being caused. Let them show us what can be done to alleviate the pain that not only makes them suffer, but makes all of us suffer as well. So what sort of organization will it be, the self-help group promoting organizations that helps foster self-help groups leading the end of extreme poverty? Well, I think there's two key strengths needed in these organizations. One is the ability to listen. Listening is the, the best form of giving honor to another person to hear what they have, to validate the pain that they feel, to acknowledge that they have good ideas about what to do about it. Our leaders and our implementers and self-help promoting organizations must first of all be listeners. They, they must be the ones that come and, and draw out of the people that they are working with, what are the challenges, what are the problems, what do you think needs to be done here? Secondly, they need to learn to be facilitators, facilitators who work in the background. In our trust banks, I could always tell a good uh, trust bank organizer because she was the one that sat in the back of the meeting. She did not lead the meeting. She sat in the back. She watched the people leading. She would give nods of support. Um, if there was a problem, she would take the leaders aside afterwards and gently correct them or suggest other ways they might do things. But she always reaffirmed the leadership. And when problems arose and people turned to her, she would turn back to the leaders and say, what do you think we should do about this? In that way, she constantly reinforced the ability of the leaders to deal with their own challenges and their own problems. So those are two skills that I think are essential for self-help promoting organizations. You know, when we have a, a picture of the Mahatma here, when, when Gandhi was leading the independence movement here in India, he, he held these great demonstrations which, which brought publicity and, and sort of showed the world the injustices that were occurring in this part of the world. He also created this group of governors that could take over, people who could lead the country after it was done. But then he also created the ashrams, and the ashrams were a place in which people could begin living independently. He said, you know, that colonization was not just another group of people who came here and took over our land. Colonization was also something that happened in our heads. We became colonized. We began to believe the things that they were taught, or we believed old things that were no longer true. So the ashram was a place where people would live a different way of life a truly independent way of life, a life where people work together in the fields and people learn together in the schools, no matter what your caste, no matter what your family, no matter what your wealth. It was a place where people treated each other with dignity and learned to listen to each other and validate each other's points of view. The same is true for us as we look to end extreme poverty. It is a way of thinking. It is the systems that we have created that 
allows extreme poverty to exist in our world. And if we want to make a change, if we want to see it end, we need to learn to listen to the people who feel that pain the worst. And we need to give them the platforms in which they can help organize us to bring an end to that sort of poverty. I saw this happening in another country in Latin America, this time the country of Colombia, where there were, you, you may know about the drug wars that have happened in Colombia and the, the rural <coughs> areas, so poor people living in the rural area ended up moving into the city to survive. <coughs> and this, we had groups of trust banks, thank you, working uh, in the city where these refugees had come from the rural areas. And there was one trust bank that had been operating there for two years, and the women had done quite well. They'd saved their money together, they'd invested in their businesses, the businesses had grown, they continued saving money. In fact, they'd called themselves the Gift of God Trust Bank, because they saw it was God's gift to them to be able to have this group where they could work together to, to solve some of their issues. And it came to the time of meeting once where they talked about what are community problems and that we might be able to do something about. And the leader of the meeting said, you know, my, my heart is broken. Every time I come to our meeting, I see this woman who's just come into our community and she's come in with absolutely nothing. All she has is a baby with her and the clothes she wore as she came in, but that's all, she has nothing else. In fact, for shelter for the night, what she's done is she's taken an old shopping cart and turned it upside down and put cardboard over it, and that is where she and her baby sleep at night. And the leader said, isn't there something that we can do as a group to help this woman? And so the women, you know, discussed for a while, argued back and forth for a bit, but finally they came up with an idea. They would take half of their accumulated savings and they would use it to help this woman. So their accumulated savings was about $200 US, so they took $100. Then being smart businesswomen like they were, they went to the richest person they knew, who was a doctor who visited them every so often, and they asked him to match their gift. He matched their gift. So then they went to the lumber store and they asked the, the owner to help them out, and he said, look, I'll sell you at cost what I have, <coughs> and then I have scrap lumber in the back, you can take whatever you need of that. The women took all of this together. They, they went to the, the woman under the shopping cart. They, they asked her what help she needed. They helped design a, a home with her. They built a new shelter for her. It wasn't a grand house, but it was enough to keep her safe and keep her dry when the rains came. And what really struck me about this story is the women telling the story the joy on their faces when they could tell what they were able to do for someone else, that they, instead of being people who received the gift of God, now were people who gave the gift of God to others. That is the energy that will end poverty here in India. And our job is to help listen to the people in that condition, to help them facilitate and harness their own energy, and to work with them to make it happen. But be careful. You may end up with a pickaxe axe in your hand, channeling out volcanic rocks, building trenches for new water supplies. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful, wonderful thoughts on the SAGU movement as a tool for poverty eradication and to bring transformation in the life of women or human resource. Thank you. Now I invite Sri Surya Kumar, CGM Nabad, to say a few words about Nabad's view on the SAG movement in India. Om <coughs> Shri Manjunathaya Namaha. Dharmadikari of Dharmasthala Manjunatha Swami Temple, Dr. Virendra Hagdeji, Honorable Union Finance Minister, Madam Nirmala Sitaramanji, Honorable Chief Minister, Government of Karnataka, Shri B.S. Yudhuryapaji, Chairperson of Janvikasa Program of SKDRDP, Hemavati Amma, Managing Director, LIC, Shri Sunil Kumarji, CEO Syndicate Bank, Shri Murtunjay Mahapatraji, Senior Fellow, Results Education Foundation, Chicago Dr. Larry Reed, 
Ladies and gentlemen, Elargo Namaskara, which means I bow down to the divinity in you all. I would briefly talk about self-help group movement, which NAVAD has been associated since a very long time. And I would talk about SKDRDP very, very briefly. I think all of us know that SSG movement, SSG model came from Karnataka. And, and, this was a, and this was a result of an action research project which Marada and Nabad conducted in 1987. Let me surprise you once again. When Nabad first wanted to link SSGs to the banks, we had a formidable target of 500 SSGs to be linked to the banks in 1992. From, from that moment, 27 years after, we have 10 million SSGs, which touch the lives of 120 million households in the country. They have, they have 23 billion rupees of savings. We have 87 billions of loans out, outstanding to the self-help groups. A formidable achievement in a small period of time. And all these things were possible because of one individual, Dr. C. Rangarajan, the then governor of Reserve Bank of India, who helped Nabat to spearhead this movement, who saw the power of this idea, who enabled the banks to give money to these organizations which are informal. I think a great thanks to him. We will have an opportunity to see him and hear him tomorrow. Nabat continues to help self-help group movement in various ways. We support for formation of self-help groups, provide micro-enterprises, and provide a market exposure. And let me just give you a small example. Recently, two weeks back, we invited 80 self-help groups from 16 states to be here in Bangalore to do a Grameen Habba. So in five days, they had a huge contact with the uh, discerning consumers of uh, uh, Bangalore, and they did a sale of one crore rupees. 10 million rupees. And Nabad began a new, a new subject called e Shakti, which is, on the, uh, which is on the movement of the Digital India, launched by the Honorable Prime Minister. We are digitizing the SSG data so that the banks can take correct decisions, and which will also improve the SSG movement deepening and widening. Over the three decades, SSG movement has created a huge ecosystem. We created, we created the self-help self -help group promotion institutions. We created several BCs, several MFIs, and now many small finance banks. In this ecosystem, SKDRDP stands out so tall. And let me also say, it may not be out of place to say, SSG and SKDRDP are synonyms in Karnataka. They have achieved this by touching the lives of people in myriad ways. So what is the USP of the SKDRDP? For SKDRDP, SSG is the basic tool. They have converged everything to the self-help group. That is a basic building block. They have worked with agriculture. They have worked with insurance. They worked with micro enterprises. And they have a brand called Siri, which markets all these things. So, and they provide credit at the doorsteps, they train the bankers, they train the SSG women, and beyond all, they assure the bankers the money which they give is properly utilized and the money comes back on time. This is a great achievement SKDRDP has done. It is a virtuous and a perfect cycle. Nabat is very fortunate to be associate a staunch ally of SKDRDP since very, very beginning. Let me just give you one simple example of what we worked on, on agriculture. We worked with 50,000 farmers along with SKDRDP, 20,000 hectares of rice cultivation for three years for growing something, for, use, for growing rice in SRI method, system of rice intensification, where the water is given as and when the plant wants, not put the plant in a knee deep water. What, it, what the system does, the system enables the plant to put around 60 to 70 panicles which gives rice grains, and the yield of the program, yield of the farmers went up by almost 40 to 45%. So, to put simply, 
In SK, to put simply in one word, there is no parallel to SKDRDP. And one of the key objectives of this conference is can we develop clones of SKDRDP contextualized to various geographies of the country and abroad. That is one of the major objectives. So while the SA and uh, the Honorable Chief Minister was talking, SK SSG movement is one of the largest microfinance programs in the world. It is also the largest well-coordinated programs in the world where the borrowing members, civil society, banks, government work in unison. This is a success story of self-help groups uh, from the India. And, uh, but at the, in the larger microcredit sector, we have some other issues of credit discipline, we have issues of governance, we have issues of delinquencies. Then a question comes, do these concerns apply to the SKDRDP also? I will give you an answer in a slightly a different way. Let me just bring in a comparison between a noun and a verb. A noun is basically static. Verb reflects action. All aspects of life are always ever moving and reflect action. Those organizations which enhance the life attract synchronicity. When synchronicity pervades, life becomes enriching. And those organizations which enrich the lives of people always thrive and sustain. So, you got the answer? Jai Hind. Namaskaram to all of you. Thank you. Friends, this evening is a very special one for us. For us, in the SHG movement and microfinance sector, 